going on guys? Charles Wayne Rob, aka the Handsome Home Buyer, aka Captain Hermit, and on today's educational vlog, we are going to talk about understanding flood zones. All right, so understanding flood zones. As an investor, as a realtor, as everything, it is very, very important to understand flood zones and how it works, especially in, if you're working in the town of North Hempstead, okay? So where to start? And it's, there's, there's two main things. A, so you don't get fucked, and so you understand the construction costs if you're building a house or raising a house in the area, okay? So let's first talk about number two, which is construction costs. If you're a developer and you're gonna build or raise a house in the area, you have to understand that a lot more goes into building a house that is in a flood zone, okay? Let's talk about building new construction for a second here, okay? The big thing is the foundations. The foundations are very expensive. You're talking about 40, 45, Fifty thousand dollars on average. If you're building a house that's anywhere from you know sixteen to twenty-two hundred square feet down by the water, it can get even more expensive. Why? You have the eight to ten feet, sometimes less. It really depends. If you're in like a real, real flood zone, you know AE flood zone, and you really have to raise the house, like you go down to Long Beach, you go into like South Belmore, South Merrick, you have to be up six feet, eight feet, ten feet, sometimes twelve or even fifteen feet. Those foundations are big money, it's a lot of concrete. A lot of guys that do foundations also don't have the forms for that size, so there's fewer people that are doing them. All makes the price go up. I recently did one down in Baldwin. Wasn't anywhere near the water, but still in a flood zone. Uh, the foundation cost us $45,000. Like I said, A, it's a bigger foundation. B, helical piles. Right? So between the helical piles and the foundation, it gets very expensive. Another thing you also have to know is once you hit three stories, because the foundation that you can park cars in, that's considered the first story, then the, the second story, which is really the first story that has living space on it, and then the third story, which is really the second story, you have to put sprinklers. So sprinklers in a house are gonna run you anywhere on average between $8,000 and $15,000. Okay, another thing to look out for in that situation is you might need a designated water line. So you have to, you have to deal with um, the water department, get them to bring a second water meter, tap a line. It, it, gets, uh, it gets involved. These are just things that you need to know and obviously these are things that translate into money. If you're gonna raise a house, again, remember, you're still looking at that expensive foundation, 40, 45, $50,000 depending. Now you have to lift the house. You could easily spend 60, $80,000 depending on the size of the house and the complexity to lift on lifting a house. A lot of times, unless the house is selling for really big money, it doesn't really make sense to lift a house. If you're an investor, you're gonna buy for land value, you're gonna demolish what's there, and then you're gonna build a new house typically makes more sense, All right? So you don't get fucked. And this really applies to uh, homeowners that have houses that they're gonna sell that they had during Sandy, investors that are buying houses. So let me explain. If you're buying a house today that was flooded during Sandy at any level, or more importantly, that the town has stamped, because the town has different levels of what the damage in that area is like, what happens is you need to have had, or you need to get a storm damage permit. So if the house is damaged, most of the people repair the house without getting any kind of permits because it was pandemonium and it makes sense that people wouldn't get it. If you're gonna do any kind of work to the house, so let's say you have an open permit on the house. In order to close the open permit, the town is gonna say, hey, listen, we just found that this house is in a flood zone and that you need to file a storm damage permit. So if the house is clean and nothing crazy went on, it's not that big a deal. Let's say you have to close out that permit for a deck, they make you file a maintained storm damage permit, you have to have hopefully captain permit, come in there, do drawings of the entire house, give you a letter, you usually need a plumber or electrician to sign off as well. It can get decently costly, but it's not that crazy. Now, let's say you wanna do renovation work to that house in scenario one. Let's say you wanna do a gut renovation or whatever it might be. You have to make sure that the renovation does not exceed, now listen to what I'm saying, 51% of the assessed value of the property itself, not including the land. And what do I mean by that? 
If you were to file permits to do any kind of work on the house, let's say you want to put a kitchen in, they're going to stop you and they're going to say, we need things, we need plans. We need to see if there was any insurance proceeds paid out on this property and how much they were. And we need to know what the assessed value is. So what they're going to do is they're going to make you reach out to the National Insurance uh, Flood Hotline and they're going to make you get the history, the entire history of all the flood payouts from FEMA, from the insurance company on that particular property. Then they're going to make you go down to Nassau County Assessor and then make you pull the assessed value as per a certain time frame, depending on when you're doing this. And let's say your property is assessed for $350,000. It has nothing to do with value. It's assessed at $350,000. They're going to divide that 350 into land and the house itself, or the improvements as they call it. Let's say they're going to tell you the land, the land's worth 200, the house is worth 150. That means that the renovations that you're going to do to the house cannot exceed $75,000 because it's 150,000 that the house is worth. If you exceed $75,000 in their mind and they set the price based on the renovations, they're going to tell you, we think this is X, we think this is X amount of dollars worth of renovation. They will tell you, you have to raise your house. That's right. Why is this a big deal? I mean, it's a big deal on many different levels, but you really have to screen these properties for open permits, missing permits, etc., and then understand that if you're ever going to do work to the house, you have to make sure it doesn't exceed 50% of the assessed, uh, assessed value of the property itself. And as time goes on, the, prop, the, the house itself is actually worth less and the land is worth more. Sometimes it becomes tighter and tighter and tighter. Very, very you know, complicated shit. That's why it's really important to have a team of experts like your architect or like Captain Permit, preferably, who you can call and talk to about this. All the realtors that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, I tell them, listen, you get any kind of listing on the water, call us first, because there's ways that we can work around and ways we can massage things and do things in the right order so it doesn't trigger something like this. We get horror phone calls from people that just say, I have to raise my house. Town says I have to raise my house. Let me digress for one second. I forgot, very important. Let's say you're going to do a renovation on the house and let's say, you know, the, the house itself, they, they assess it at $150,000. Let's say you're only going to do $25,000 worth of work, but let's say the old owner on that insurance printout that I mentioned before got paid $150,000, even if they didn't put it in the house, even if they bought a boat, left the country, it doesn't matter. The fact that monies has been paid out and it's recorded in excess of 50% of the value of the structure itself will trigger you to have to raise the house in the town of Hempstead. So again, reach out to the captain, 516-513-8838. If you're a realtor who's gonna be listing a property in a flood zone area of any kind, if you're an investor who's gonna be doing work on a house in a flood zone area of any kind. Now, in other townships, it's not the same. They're not nearly as strict. You do have to be careful though. I was recently got an accepted offer on a property in Babylon, Babylon Village, down by the water that I was told doesn't need to be raised. We called the village, the village said, stamped, gotta be raised. So it's always important to follow up in the municipality, make sure that there's no markings on the house, make sure they haven't flagged it to be raised because the townships literally have people walking through the streets, they know exactly what got flooded, how bad it got flooded, and they've set that up in the system accordingly so they know. So there's, there's no bullshitting them at this point. So again, that is understanding flood zones, I hope. If you've gone this far, we appreciate it. If you click that subscribe, ring the bell, give us a like, give us a comment, give us a follow, repost this, do it all. I'll see you next week on the next one.